It's the show where Hawaii's newsmakers come to talk and to take your questions live. From the nation's capital to Honolulu Hale, from the state legislature to the fifth floor, we bring the experts to you and ask them what you want to know. Spotlight Hawaii with Yanji Denise and Ryan Kalei on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. Well, happy Aloha Friday. Thanks for tuning in here to Spotlight Hawaii live on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. I'm Ryan Kalei Suji, joined by Yanji Denise. And this morning, we're going to be spotlighting a project that we've been talking more and more about over the last few months. It's part of Governor Green's initiative uh, and really his com- combating homelessness and affordable housing. That's right. In his State of the State address, uh, right coming into office in January, the governor declared a state of emergency when it comes to homelessness, clearing a lot of red tape when it comes to building kauhale, which are these tiny homes with shared spaces around uh, bathing and also kitchen facilities and, and shared spaces like that. Uh, the very One of the very first ones that uh, went up is a stone's throw from Washington, Pla- Washington Place. He likes to say it's right in his backyard, walking distance, of course, from the Queen's Medical Center, and that is that medical respite Kohale. I've been on the ground there and open for about six weeks. And so we want to check into the folks who are actually doing the operation and planning the next Kohale that, of course, is State Homelessness Director James Koshiba and also Dara Kauhane Florki, uh, who is the Executive Director of Project Vision, which is the nonprofit organization that is running the day to day operations there. Thank you both for being here. Thanks for having us. So kind of a long introduction there, but a lot to cover. Uh, Dara, I want to start with you. You know, you've come in as the as the lead nonprofit who is actually delivering services. Tell us about the clients you're serving, what the last six weeks have been like, and, and the difference that you think that this project is making. Oh, and Dara, you're oh, we're muted here. There we Thank go. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes, we, we've been running for about six weeks now, um, and every day has been a new learning experience. We're grateful for the patients that have come through and also for the neighbors around the Pulama Ola Kauhale um, that have really helped us to create a community. So we're seeing everything from, you know, those who are maybe going through chemotherapy, just had a stroke, just had surgery, uh, a lot of different conditions that really we take for granted having a home and a safe place to be, a clean place to be. Um, after we go through something traumatic like that in the hospital. Um, It's been a a, a real exciting time for us as we've learned our staff. This is our first 24-7 operations, uh, and we're we're thrilled to be able to get to know the patients, to have that one-on-one time with them, but also to be able to open this facility, this beautiful facility that was uh, created by Nani Medeiros and Homemade, uh, be able to open that to the neighbors that also live uh, within the Capital District. And James, I'm wondering if you can expand a little bit more on your end uh, from your perspective and what you've seen, the successes, maybe some of the unexpected challenges that have come about with this particular project. Well, first, I just want to give um, full credit to Dara and the Project Vision Hawaii team. You know, the time frame for this was incredibly short. We had um, eight weeks to plan and get it constructed. And during that time, it was also getting operations set in place. And so Dara and her team have been incredible, working out everything from referral processes from hospitals to treatment plans to how um, to build community through social activities in the space. And they took a big risk and a big leap with us, jumping in and saying, we'll we'll run it. Uh, They raised their hand. They said, we'll run it. We'll staff it 24-7. Um, and it, it's been incredible um, what they've done in the last six weeks. Um, j- just a couple of things I would add to what Dara said, you know, um, some additional benefits besides people having that space to fully recover and heal. Um, I think we've also already seen several instances where people would likely have gone back to the hospital and back to the ER, but because they're in a space where they're safe, they're stable, and they have access to medical care and professionals. They haven't returned to the hospital. So Dara mentioned there's um, a stroke victim who's recovering in the Kauhale. He thought he might be having another stroke because there was a nurse there that could take his vitals and reassure him that he was okay. You know, he stayed in place and he's he's doing well. 
And there have been several instances like that where just having the stability and again, access to medical care has prevented return visits to the hospital or to the ER. And one other, um, I think, pleasant surprise for us has been that sense of community that's formed. I mean, it was very intentional to call this place a kohale, a village. And even though we knew this was going to be temporary, we really wanted to encourage people to, to build that sense of community and to take some communal responsibility for taking care of each other and of the place. And we've seen that happen. I mean, the, the patients there have really bonded. Um, there's there's the, the patient, Dara mentioned, who has just started chemotherapy, likely wouldn't have been able to undergo chemotherapy if she was still on the street. But also another patient that she met there is the one taking her to her chemotherapy um, treatments, her visits to, to, the, to the hospital for treatment on a regular basis. So they've formed a bond, they're supporting each other. And again, just one example of how people are helping each other's healing. And the theory behind Kohale is that community is essential to people's healing and growth. We need the medical care, we need the professional support and services, certainly, but those supportive relationships are just as critical. Dara, let's dive a little deeper into that patient population. I'm interested to know typically how long folks are staying at the Kohale. Is this seen as a more transitional um, experience or is this something where, you know, I would imagine that if you get chemotherapy, uh, we're talking about a pretty long stay. So, so how is that working? And once they leave the facility, where do they typically go? So the governor's office and, and Project Vision wanted to try something different with this, uh, with this project. And so this pilot uh, in this pilot, we do not have a time requirement or a time, um, you know, how long that they can stay. We're trying to be more flexible with that and create something that is more centered around the patient and is more centered around that compassionate care for them that they need to truly heal fully. So we have we have two levels of clearance that we are looking for when we're looking to just discharge someone. So medical clearance and then their social clearance. So medically, you know, they may have gone in for a wound, gone into the ER or been an inpatient for a wound. That wound may now be healed. So they're medically cleared. Um, but on the social side, we know that there's a lot of things that we can do to support them um, along with our outreach workers, our peer specialists, our case managers, um, and additionally, our behavioral health specialists that we're partnering with in Iola Lahui, um, you know, making sure that they have everything in place so that they can succeed in whatever their next step may be. And so that's something that we've been working through um, with James's office um, and with our partner organizations at IHS and H3RC to make sure that uh, we've, we've been able to address all of their needs. At the beginning, they do a needs assessment, what they think um, you know, they could use support with, whether that's benefits applications, housing applications, um, getting a primary care provider, being in touch with a therapist or psychologist, uh, whatever that may be, whatever they feel that their needs are, you know, getting help with those legal documents, um, getting tickets cleared, for example. So we're grateful for the flexibility of this program that allows us to uh, identify what those needs are for these individuals, and then bring in those um, bring in those guests, bring in those extra services, so that we can fulfill those. And so, on the social services side, once we get through their needs assessment, then we'll talk about uh, their discharge planning and where where their next step should be. Most of the individuals that are staying there um, have suggested that they're either interested in treatment or they're interested in independent housing, um, and so that's something that we're trying to support them with. Uh, most of the patients, since it's only been a month and a half, most of the patients have been with us the entire time uh, because of the uh, type of condition that they have. But also, you know, these barriers that keep them from getting into permanent housing or into other programs are very high. And so it's going to take time for us to be able to work through them. And that's why we feel so grateful for the opportunity of this program is we really get to see how long it takes to work through those barriers here. Um, and so just just really appreciative of of that compassionate care that comes first rather than the finances or the, um, you know, the other barriers that often other programs have to deal with. So we're, we're thankful to be part of this this pilot and we'll have a lot of data for you folks after this six months is done. 
Yeah, I'm sure a lot uh, hard to kind of measure all that just in one month. Uh, but with some of the things that you described, there no doubt uh, continues to be a demand. I want to bring a question here from Heidi, one of our viewers, asking, uh, are you going to expand the Kauhale units near Queens, uh, knowing that there isn't really a set timeline and that the demand will continue to grow? Uh, James, question for you. I mean, is there any talks of potentially adding more units to the exi existing infrastructure there? Or what does that look like uh, when the demand becomes so great uh, and noting that the types of services that are currently being offered could be offered to more people because of the need. Sure. So the, the demand is already exceeding capacity, right? We're full. There's a wait list. Um, to answer the viewer's question, um, there there are no plans to expand the current Kohale. This Kohale, when we propose it, was intended to be temporary. And what we've been doing simultaneously with getting this one stood up and operating is working with other partners in the community to open up medical respite space um, and make sure there are beds available in other facilities in the community. As those bed spaces get opened up and staffed, then we'll be able, the, the pressure on the medical respite kohale, the need for the medical respite kohale will diminish. Then our plan is to take those units, those tiny home housing units that have been built and move them to a permanent kohale site elsewhere where they can serve as long-term uh, space for people to be housed and healed. But we're working to get community bed space open so that the need for the Kauhale diminishes. And the plan is to have um, this Kauhale wrap up by December. James, I want to stick with you for a moment. You know, we've had you and Nani Medeiros on here in the past, and the governor really has set a goal of having a dozen Kauhale throughout the throughout the state, six on Oahu, 12 or 12, six more uh, across the neighbor islands. Tell us about how that, the site, uh, you know, visits or, you know, scouting is going, if you will, and where you're looking at putting the next Kauhale. Yeah, so um, we, we'd like the next one. We have a, a site um, near Middle Street um, that's state-owned land that we're looking at for the very next Kauhale. Um, since we announced the initiative and after the legislature appropriated funds to make it a reality, um, I've been approached, we've been approached by uh, partners out in the community across the islands. Some of these are nonprofit organizations that do homeless services or develop affordable housing. Others are private landowners or churches that are coming forward and saying, hey, we have a parcel of land available here. We'd like to drop some tiny homes or we have a vacant building. We'd like to use it for a kauhale. So we have several dozen potential sites. There's still a lot of work to do in assessing the feasibility of creating a kauhale in each of those spaces, the, phys the physical feasibility of it. Um, and the other thing is, for each of these Kauhale sites, we want to identify a strong community partner, as we did with Project Vision for the Medical Respite Kauhale. The key to success um, for each of these other village spaces is going to have is to have a partner in the community who knows the community well, um, and who's going to build that space as a village with connections to the wider community. And Dar, I'm wondering if you can expand a little bit about how, you know, Project Vision got to this point uh, that has become such an essential part of this project, but just the evolution of your organization, of how it started uh, initially, and, and how you've come to be this reliable partner for this project and potentially more projects with Kauhale's moving forward. Yeah, well, uh, I, that's always a fun story to share how we've gotten from uh, glasses to now working in a medical respite Kauhale with the governor's office. Uh, it, it all started by um, us with a, a retinal camera on an RV going around and doing diabetic retinopathy screenings. Um, so as you can tell from our name, Project Vision, um, our roots are within optometry and ophthalmology. And so we've done that, uh, you know, vision screenings, vision exams, uh, cataract surgeries, specialty care um, throughout the state and also throughout the Pacific. Uh, we have clinics throughout uh, many of our sister island nations. Uh, when we, we realized quickly that we were utilizing mobile clinics and there's a lot more types of services, types of medical care that we could provide utilizing these vital resources. And so we've expanded our primary care, um, expanded the types of services that we do um, through these mobile units to include showers for the unhoused. Um, and that's really how we got into the space of homelessness um, and learned from our partner organizations where the true needs are uh, and been able to partner with them to 
not only learn how to do street medicine, um, but also to bring more case management and outreach services. Uh, and we've, we've done so not only in the unhoused community, but also within the incarcerated community um, and within our public housing and, and rural areas as well. So it's really the, the, the vital resource of having those mobile units. Um, and we've expanded to having 10 of those now across the state. Uh, we have teams in all four counties that are really dedicated to not only utilizing those mobile clinics, but also going out by foot for those harder to reach locations. So we're really grateful to have gone from, you know, our, our what we know best, which is in, in ophthalmology and optometry. We still do those programs. We're still in the schools um, doing vision and now hearing screenings. Uh, we still go into um, all of the programs and facilities through the Department of Health. Uh, but we're also really excited to be in this space of um, supporting in homelessness and, and now into affordable housing with James's office. Hey, James, let's talk about the bottom line when it comes to the financials of this. Um, what kind of resources are needed to support something like this? And as we build out these other Kauhale and find these nonprofit partners, um, you know, what in, at, at the end of the day, what does something like this actually cost? It, it's going to vary widely from Kohale to Kohale, both the development costs and the operating costs. It's going to depend on the scale. It's going to depend on the location and on the types of support services that are needed at the outset. But one of the things that we're um, communicating to community partners and that I share with the legislature as well as we're making the case for this is that the idea is not for Kohale to be supported by um, a nonprofit or community organization in perpetuity. The goal really is to build the capacity of residents there to function as a community and to take more and more responsibility for their own community. Again, taking care of people and place. And as that happens, in fact, the, the way I've described it sometimes to interested parties who have said we'd like to create a Kohale is our job, all of our jobs should be to work ourselves out of a job. We want people to be independent. We want people to be functioning as a community and to depend on us less to provide There'll still be some need for professional services. There'll still be some need for assistance. But the more people can take on responsibility for things like, you know, looking in on each other or groundskeeping or maintenance or security in the form of a neighborhood watch, that all reduces operating costs over time. And that's not only, not only for the cost effectiveness of government, um, but it's really, um, it does two, two other things. One is that's what ensures that we can keep these spaces affordable in perpetuity so that they can be truly affordable and deeply affordable, affordable for people at the bottom of the income scale is if we bring those costs down. And the second is, you know, to borrow a phrase from Twinkle Borge, Kuliana wakes up mana, responsibility wakes up the spirit. Um, having a role in your community and, and some sense of responsibility to the people around you is part of people's healing and growth. So for both those reasons, we want them baked into every kohale. You know, James, I want to stick with you. The, one of the concerns was uh, how the community would react to a project like this. And there is that concern for that, you know, a phrase of NIMBY or not in my backyard that many people uh, may not welcome this idea. I'm wondering if there was any pushback with this uh, project, uh, you know, right across from Queens Hospital. Of course, there aren't maybe necessarily a high residential area because it's in the urban core uh, next to the state capitol and the governor's mansion, but beyond the governor himself, who of course welcomed it into his backyard. Uh, has there been any sort of comments or any pushback that you received from that general community uh, of the downtown district? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, from, the, from the day we proposed it, um, there was quite a bit of concern and pushback against the idea of having it there. Um, people said, you know, if you put this here, it's gonna attract people. Um, to the area, we're gonna have more homeless in the area. And our response to that was, there are people that are living unhoused in the capital district already. They're all around the state capital and in the region. And now they will have access to a bathroom. They'll have access to shower. They'll have access to some of the services that Project Vision provides, including some medical care. Just this morning, I did outreach in the capital district, which we do weekly. And there was somebody near the Kauhale, staying outside near the Kauhale, who had a pretty nasty wound on his leg. And one of the nurses from the Kahale came out and did some wound care with him, which probably prevented you know, a more serious situation from developing. I talked to another gentleman who said, who thanked us for creating the medical respite Kahale and for having access to a shower because he said both he and a couple of other people he knows, now that they can get cleaned up on a regular basis, they're out there doing job, job searches. And 
you know, so that there's there's a bunch of benefits that are coming out of having the kalhale there. And um, I think that for the most part, a lot of the nimbyism comes from the unknown, not knowing what it's going to be like. And once something is there and people can see how it's functioning and ideally meet some of the people who are staying there. I mean, there's some really incredible folks uh, with um, remarkable generosity, given the situation that they're in. There's a woman staying at the Kauhale uh, who's in a wheelchair. She just got a new wheelchair. So she said, is there somebody outside the Kauhale that can use my old wheelchair? She sees folks, um, you know, who are unhoused in the capital district who have trouble getting around. She says, there's someone else that can use my old wheelchair. But again, it's that kind of community support plus the availability of services and hygiene that we think is going to have ripple effects and benefits beyond just the 10 folks that are in the Kalhale itself at any given time. Yeah, Dara, let's talk about those resources that you are providing. And, and I'm curious to know how many people who are not necessarily staying in the in those tiny homes themselves, but just the wider community that James is talking about are utilizing those showers and, and sanitary services. Do you have any numbers or, uh, as to who you're seeing and, and how many folks you're seeing? Uh, just And just so people on, um, sort of are aware, Project Vision operates these hie hie, which are um, large trailers that have showers inside. You may have seen some in your community. They're kind of roving around. I know there were some in Chinatown for a time as well, but tell us who's utilizing those services now. Yeah, I'm looking at the numbers right now and we've already given 306 showers for individuals that are not residing at the Pulama Ola Kauhale. Um, so that just shows you how many people are coming through, how many of the neighbors are grateful for this um, this new resource for them. Um, so they can come in and utilize the bathrooms. It's a shower, uh, toilet, sink and mirror, um, you know, get a fresh shave, get a hot shower, get some privacy and security where you can actually lock the door for 10, 20 minutes. Uh, we don't we don't limit them on how long they can take the shower because we don't know how long it's been since their last one. Um, but also while they're there, um, sometimes we have food that's donated. Um, but I think most importantly is that our peer specialists and our outreach workers are on site and roam around in the area to get to know um, the individuals in the area. Um, and if they don't already have a case manager, you know, pointing them to the correct organization. But as much as we can, supporting them with things like I mentioned, their legal documents, you know, the, the idea of not having your birth certificate or your social security card so you can get a, an, a state ID so that you can apply to rent something or apply for a job. Um, all of these things, you know, snowball into these, this large barrier, this large wall um, to getting back in, in into the system. And so we're, we're just trying to minimize um, any of those issues so that they can get into a permanent space or can get into that self-dependence. Um, and I think a lot of it is just that uh, non-judgmental, that passionate um, conversation. And something that I'm most proud of within our organization is that uh, half of our staff have that lived or living experience. So they've been in the same situations um, as those that they're serving. And so you can really have a conversation and understanding about what the needs are, what it takes to get to that next step um, and how to make that encouragement to do so. Um, so we're just grateful to be able to provide any of those services. Of course, you know, when when the clients are, are ready and willing, um, something that's also been quite fun to see come out of this project is that um, some of our contractors have actually hired uh, the neighbors that come to utilize the showers. For example, our, our clean aisle company um, that does our, our cleaning. Um, throughout the facility. They've actually hired two of our neighbors that have been coming daily to use the showers. Um, and for the first time in a long time, um, they have you know some income and are looking towards their next step. Um, one of them actually just um, got, uh, got noticed that he's gonna be moving into his own place. It's been about five years since he's been on the streets. And so uh, we're really excited for his move in next week when he'll have you know, a roof over his head and a lock on that door. Well, wow, it's great to hear those types of success stories. Uh, you know, there may be people who are watching this uh, this morning, or I'm sure that there are other individuals who hear the work that's being done uh, and want to get involved and want to help. Uh, are, are you open to volunteers? How does this work when community members may want to provide some sort of service uh, or may want to donate food? You know, there's always just uh, this uh, a lot of com compassion to people in the community, but sometimes they just don't know how. 
to give, uh, what would your recommendation be for someone that sees this, maybe lives nearby the area and wants to provide some sort of support? How would you uh, advise they best uh, do that? We, we talked about NIMBYism a bit ago, and it, it's been so refreshing to see how many people have the opposite uh, feeling about this. And many people are excited to see that something is being done. Uh, and we've had a lot of individuals come by and drop off paintings, for example, an artist dropped off a bunch of paintings and we allowed the residents to select which ones they liked best and, you know, decide where they wanted to hang it in their room. And that's the first time that they've gotten to decorate, uh, you know, their own space uh, since they were little for some of them. Um, some people have dropped off games, for example, like you said, dropped off food. Um, we, we're taking a lot of donations of clothing, clothing or hygiene products. Uh, pretty much we'll, we'll, we'll take it all. And if we can't use it, we'll share it with our, our partner organizations who are doing similar work. Um, if anyone is interested in volunteering, we also have our website, Project Vision Hawaii slash Kauhale. Uh, and there you can sign up to volunteer. We currently have weekly activities on Tuesday, Thursdays, and Saturdays where we're inviting community members or um, different groups to come on site for, say, an exercise. We have a yoga group that comes to do seated yoga once a week uh, to do game night. Uh, this, the clients really enjoy playing bingo um, and get really competitive. Uh, with the staff, I keep telling the staff we don't need to win. <laughs> so it, it's been uh, it, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, we have another you know an, another set time. I think it's the Thursday evenings uh, where we're trying to bring in more activities such as art or crafts. So if there's anyone um, that would love to share their talent, uh, we would love to have you folks on site. And I think that's so important to have those conversations and get to know the stories of these patients that we're serving. That nimbyism can be combated like like James said, of knowing who it is that we're serving and why they're in the positions that they are and how, you know, when we all come together, we can make that solution for them. You know, James, when we hear stories like the one Dara shared about, the, you know, the gentleman who's going to be actually moving into something, um, you know, just to see that progression is, is incredible and it makes a lot of folks want to know when's the next one. So we know that the Middle Street site is something that's in the works. How soon could we actually see something materialize there? Yeah, we'd like to have it started before the end of the year. Okay, well, let's, uh, we'll continue <laughs> to stay posted. That's uh, It's hard to believe it's already July, uh, so that will come up in no time soon. Uh, we're almost out of time here this morning, but before we wrap up, wanted to allow uh, each of you to kind of share your final thoughts about how things are going and this progress and any final message that you may have for viewers. Uh, James, we'll start off with you, your thoughts as we sort of wrap this up and uh, the success that has already been uh, with this particular project over the past month. Yeah, I guess that, you know, what I'm um, most first, again, just grateful to Project Vision for taking the risk. And it's been a learning process for all of us because of the condensed time frame. And the biggest um, and most pleasant surprise for me, again, is how quickly community has formed and how people have taken responsibility for taking care of the space and each other. You know, there's one guest there that is disinfects all the surfaces. There's um, another resident patient there who has helped out on security sometimes. And that gives me confidence that community can form in this way and that the, the longer term vision for Kauhale of communities that are responsible for themselves and taking on this kuleana, um, that it can happen and will happen. So just appreciate the opportunity to, to learn with and from Project Vision and with the folks who are staying there right now. And, and Daryl, I'll give you the final word here, your thoughts as we wrap up and just uh, what you've been doing over the, your organization has been involved in here over this last month as you reflect back. Just want to point out that the the residents, they also really like to help out with the gardening because I do not have a green thumb. Um, and, and so I'm really grateful that some of them do and have helped us replant uh, and keep those plants alive. It, it looks it looks beautiful. And I think the fact that you know we put the extra amount of time and effort and we're able to get the donations um, from our initial partners to really make this place look nice. Um, it's, you know, very welcoming. It feels homey. Um, and I'm just excited to see what comes of the, the next Kauhales and hopeful that our experience, our, our humble mana'o that we can share from, from the six months of this pilot project uh, will help to, um, 
you know, help to guide the next the next 12 kahales that are to come. Uh, there's a lot of potential there, and, and we're seeing a lot of different gaps that together we'll be able to, to fill. Um, I, I wanted to note that we're looking at systems changes here. Um, and so one of the things that's come out of this is a, a weekly conversation with the hospitals. So we, we sit down with Queens and HPH um, on, a, on a weekly basis and are able to talk through uh, what are those discharges and those referrals look like and what can we do to, you know, where, where would be best for that patient um, and really hold each other account accountable. You know, what can the hospitals do? What can the nonprofits do? Um, what can our government do to support these individuals who need that extra support? Um, and so that's been a really great conversation and something that I think is going to um, bring, bring a lot of positives um, after this project. Well, there's a comment here this morning. Mahalo to all. So inspiring uh, coming from Ingrid. And I agree, just very in encouraging to hear the news that you shared with us this morning. So thank you so much to Dara, Dara Kahane Flurki and, of course, James Koshiba from the state of Hawaii for joining us this morning. We really do appreciate you. Thanks for having us. Oh, thank you both. Well, Ryan, you know, we talk about homeless a lot on this show. We covered, of course, the election cycle and every political, you know, every leader uh, from the top all the way down to, you know, whatever office they're running for, they all say affordable housing and homelessness are issues that they want to tackle. So it's nice to see that there are being some strides made in this space, um, particularly of folks who are so vulnerable being discharged from a medical setting and still needing continued care. And also great to hear about those additional resources that are in the area, having bathrooms and showers available. She said more than 300 showers already given out in the last six weeks. You can see, you know, just thinking in your own life, what a difference that can make. And, and you know, when she's talking about people now being able to go out for jobs and just having, you know, pride and, and hygiene, that, that's just wonderful to hear. Yeah, and really stressing that while this may be a facility that can only house a handful of people and really help in that transitional time, it really has become a space for others who are suffering through uh, some conditions or may be uh, looking for some support and services can essentially come to this area to get those showers, to get those medical support that they need uh, to really help their overall quality of life. And so while uh, they may not be able to accommodate everyone with a housing or facility for them to live in and to recover in, it really has become a center for people to, who know they can get support in an area around the Capital District, as James alluded to, that uh, currently sees uh, a lot of homeless people who are in that area. Uh, we also heard from them about their plans to, of course, uh, expand or to move on beyond just this temporary setup, really stressing that this is a temporary situation, that this is not going to be a permanent structure that will remain on the grounds uh, of the Department of Health across from Queens Hospital, but that there is a long-term plan to provide this sort of respite care beyond uh, just what is currently in place, but really stressing that that is a temporary, this is a temporary fix to something that they continue to be engaged in and looking for other facilities and services that can expand beyond just what is currently available. Yeah, the governor has a plan for a dozen of these across the state. Of course, you heard James there talking about the key missing piece, and that is having enough community partners. You heard again and again him singing the praises of Project Vision and all the work that they are doing. Medical respite kauhale, of course, is different than the 12 that will be rolled out. There will be a variety of different types of kauhale. You know, some will be um, will require less support, but in this case, as you heard, they need 24-7 medical staff, and that is a big task, of course, there. Um, there are opportunities. I loved your question about getting involved. Uh, there are plenty of opportunities for folks to pitch in or even just to, you know, go talk story and get to know uh, the, the residents there. So wonderful to hear about those opportunities as well. We'll be tracking what happens uh, in the Middle Street site. You heard there James Koshiba saying that they hope to have that up and running by the end of the year. We'll be talking to his boss on Monday. The governor is joining us and we'll be asking him about how he thinks uh, all of this is going and what his time frame is, not only for Middle Street, but the 11 beyond that. Yeah, always a lot to talk about with Governor Green. We hope you have a great weekend and we'll see you right back here for another episode of Spotlight Hawaii on Monday. Take care and aloha. Aloha.